leaving Southampton and its docks behind. 13 miles away across the Solent is the Isle of Wight. Alice Roberts is on her way there to meet a group of pioneering engineers who opened up a whole new frontier of scientific discovery. Outer space. It's hard to believe it, but 50 years ago, Britain was up there with the US and the USSR in the space race. And even more bizarrely, this is where all the action went on, the Isle of Wight. Thousands of people worked on Britain's space programme in the 1960s, over 200 of them on the Isle of Wight alone and five of them are here to take me to their base, perched high above the needles. So we're on our way up to High Down. That's right. There were never this many people around when we worked here. Very restricted who could come up here at that time. Yeah. High Down began life as a Napoleonic fort tunnelled into the chalk cliff. But in 1955, plans were afoot to turn it into a top-secret rocket site. Three years earlier, Britain had exploded her first atom bomb. Like a starting pistol, it marked the beginning of the race to manufacture our first nuclear missile. So a nuclear missile is basically a space rocket, a rocket that's shot up into space, travels along, and then re-enters the atmosphere as it nears its target. But in the 50s, nothing was known about getting into space. So by developing Nazi V2 technology, acquired after the Second World War, the task was to find out how rockets behave in space, and particularly what happens when they re-enter the atmosphere, something crucial to the success of a nuclear missile. To conduct the re-entry experiments, a space rocket, Black Knight, was built. And these engineers were challenged with the task of making sure it worked. Why did they particularly choose this site for the rocket testing? Well, it has a natural bowl, um, and we wanted the noise and the exhaust uh, steam to go out into the bay so that it, it didn't go back towards the populated areas of the island. There was already three gun emplacements here, with magazine stores underneath, which only needed a very small amount of modification to make this into a working rocket site. Were the rockets actually built on the site here? Uh, no, the actual rocket was put together at these cows and came out here for testing. And then we would bring it down to one of these gantries and we would go all through the procedure necessary to actually launch the rocket, uh, including lighting the engines, and you would see the motors with their shock diamonds coming out. Mm. So you'd be watching this rocket there and you'd be seeing the flames coming out yes, of the bottom of it. And the big steam out there. Yeah. And, and quite a roar. Uh, the only thing we didn't do was let, let it go. There's a small ball in the bottom of the rocket and there's a claw which grabs hold of it. And when we wanted it to go, the claw is open and away it goes. But we didn't do that here. While the Americans and Soviets were throwing money at their space projects, the British team were working on a shoestring budget. Forced to keep costs low, our engineers eschewed expensive development in favour of improving and refining what they already knew from the V2. The Nazis' comet engine was powered by hydrogen peroxide, familiar to some of us as hair bleach, and therefore so was Black Knight. Unlikely as it sounds, Rob James has promised to prove to me that it works. Right then, I've got a thermal imaging camera here, Rob, so uh, okay. I'm going to film the experiment as we do it. OK, so in here, in the cool box, we have the hydrogen peroxide. And it's pretty cool. Your hands look quite red, but the actual peroxide itself is glowing blue. <laughs> Pour a bit in the flask. Hydrogen peroxide breaks down to produce water and oxygen gas, but it's a very slow chemical reaction yeah and the way that chemists make reactions go faster is to use a catalyst in this case manganese dioxide and hopefully um, the heat produced in that reaction will be sufficient to convert the water to steam which is the basis of how it was used in the uh, rockets shall we go for it yes let's do it let's uh, make some rocket fuel that's fantastic <laughs> that's our very own rocket engine on the site of the original testing 
The Black Knight engines, like this one, used exactly the same principle. The red-hot steam produced by the hydrogen peroxide ignited the second propellant, kerosene, which then burned in the oxygen produced by the initial reaction. With the engines assembled and Black Knight in position, the engineers descended into the control rooms to initiate the firing. The consoles that controlled the fire were all stood across this wall here, right along. And the interesting thing is, we can still see where the sequence uh, countdown clock was by the holes on the wall there. Five, four, three, two, one, when the rocket would fire, was the point of most intensity. All the recorders in my room would come on, right. click, and then there's this rumble, as the, because you couldn't hear it, but you could feel it through yes. the ground, couldn't you, Jim? Oh, yeah. It was absolutely amazing. <clears throat> so for 30 seconds, we'd have all this rumbling around, yeah. and then it would go absolutely quiet. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and then we'd all sit back, yeah. how did it go? <laughs> At the time, you were right at the forefront of technology, weren't you? We were ahead of even the Americans in the late 50s, early 60s. And yeah. we didn't have as many explosions on the launchers as the United States. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> Very many didn't have any. With the Isle of Wight tests successful, Black Knight was ready for liftoff. With no practical UK launch site, the rockets were sent to Woomera in Australia. In all, 22 Black Knight rockets were successfully sent into space over seven years. But Britain's nuclear missile programme started to wind down in the early 1960s. However, the rocketeers realised that the technology they developed had a civilian as well as a military application. Using the same hydrogen peroxide technology perfected here, the successor to Black Knight, Black Arrow, was born created not for bombs, but to put a satellite in space. And we did it. We launched a British-built satellite into space, and this is a life-size model of Prospero. It's looking a little bit worse for wear, but of course its real counterpart has been up orbiting the Earth for the last 35 years. Seeing that Blue Peter-ish model makes me desperate to see the real thing. But since most satellites are so faint they're only visible at night, astronomer David Brearley and I have chosen a moonlit beach for a bit of satellite gazing. David, I've seen the model of Prospero and it's about the size of a dustbin. How on earth are we going to spot it up in the night sky? Well, we're going to see a very faint star moving among other very faint stars. This is the track starting here when Prospero comes out of the Earth's shadow, moving across until it goes off the left-hand edge of the map. We know it'll be passing that group of stars at 18 minutes past 12 and 12 seconds. Right. If the precise deadline and only about 30 seconds of visibility don't make this hard enough, I've also got to get these heavy binoculars in exactly the right place. I'm actually holding my breath. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. And it's coming from right to left, isn't it? Yeah. 10 seconds. Can you see it yet? No. Can't see it. I think it's gone. Oh, no. Unfortunately. Yes, I'm afraid we have missed it. It must have been fainter than yeah. predicted. Oh. Strange. Before coming here, I didn't even know we'd launched our own satellite. And now I feel really sad not to have seen it. But since Prospero was originally designed to send a radio signal back to Earth, there is a slim possibility that it's still broadcasting. With the help of rocket scientist Max Meerman, we might just be able to pick up the sound of its faint heartbeat. Bring up this little antenna here. Of course, it's a 70 satellite, so we need 70 technology to listen to it. <laughs> uh, I made a little inconometer here, and the timing is on the ground, so we can figure out kind of where it is. And do you have any idea what we're listening out for? Uh, at the moment, after so many years, you never know quite what it's going to do. You know, it's, it's, it's 30 years old. You know, try an old car, and somebody says, "Oh, let's start it up." What is it going to do? Well, I don't know. You know, after so many years, so we'll just get, we'll see if we. 
if we hear some signal, so now we're at, at 34 degrees, we'll go down a little bit. Let's we'll see if we get down to about 15 degrees now. Well, the of the sun, of course, now we're soon. That's, that's, that's some signal. There we are. Yeah, something there. Yeah, that's a, that's that's a yeah. timing that clock. That could be a timing clock. could be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 There we go. It's still alive. <laughs> it's still alive. So not only is Prospero still orbiting the Earth, but this signal proves it's still working. Back in 1971, when Black Arrow R3 launched Prospero into space, it was easy to dream that after over 25 years of work, Britain would finally be back in the big league of space nations. So Ray, you must have felt really proud when this rocket successfully launched a satellite into space. Oh, it, you know, I was told about it on a Friday with yeah. a telex from Australia. And I was over the moon, of course, uh, because it was in a perfect orbit. I had a wonderful weekend, went into a board meeting on the Monday and was promptly told that uh, the contract funding had been withdrawn and that I was to go out to High Down right away and tell them that half of them would be out of work and made redundant. So why was the programme stopped? Policy, yeah. Politics yeah, is a funny thing. It's, it's recorded in Hansard that the minister responsible for uh, this sort of science said they can see no useful commercial purpose for launching satellites uh, in the future. Right. None yes. whatsoever, yeah. despite the fact there's all yeah. those satellites out yeah. there yeah. earning boodles um, of money for the people to put them up there, our people didn't have a clue. The site was finally abandoned in June 1972. The economic crisis of the 70s forced the government to make a stark choice. To go it alone with Black Arrow, or to join forces with France to develop Concorde. They chose the latter. <laughs> 